welcome back for whatever edition of Bugs and Buds uh, with the Bug Lady we are tonight. Um, I'm glad to be back and doing this and with better lighting uh, than what I used to have where I'd be like red like a cherry tomato. Um, so I appreciate you coming out. Um, thanks for your suggestions. At this last, the last one we did, somebody specifically said, hey, let's do a sprayer one with, you know, Dram. I'm like, done. And I called up Kurt and here you are. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Suzanne Wainwright. I run Bug Lady Consulting. Um, I've been, I've had Bug Lady Consulting 20 years, but I've actually been in the green industry about 30 years now. Um, it's really the only industry I've, I've worked in. Um, with my uh, consulting business, I get to travel, oh, well, I used to travel all over the world. <laughs> um, teaching workshops and helping growers uh, deal with their pest issues. Hopefully sooner than later, I'll be back out on the road. But for the meantime, um, I'm doing some of the Zoom meetings. I've actually been doing um, some consulting through Zoom meetings lately um, and doing some training with some people too. So I'm trying to keep myself busy. Right. Um, our special guest um, is Kurt Becker, who works for DRAM. Um, I've known him for many years now. I actually just got to know him from the, the trade show circuit um, because we're at a lot of trade shows together. And, were. and I'm sorry? Were. Were. Well, <laughs> there were. There yeah. used to be shows. Hopefully there will be again someday because they're a lot of fun uh, to, to do the shows. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things about DRAM that I love is this thing right here. I, I know Kurt will probably say, oh, he has products he loves more. This is my favorite thing of all time that they do um, because of helping with nematode application. And I appreciate all the thought and work that DRAM put into making this bucket for nematode applications so that they can be put out alive and healthy. So they really do spend a lot of time engineering and developing their products and listening to the needs of their growers. So um, with that, I'm going to um, add this little message. Tonight is free for everybody, um, as I've told you before. Um, but uh, one of the ways I'm trying to generate a little income is by having these meetings. You're not required to put money in the tip jar, but if you get something really helpful out of it from me, you don't have to tip me for Kurt's information. No, no. But, uh, you know, um, if these meetings are helpful for you, you know, this does help me out um, a bit right now until I can get back out on the road. If, if I was traveling and working normally, I would, I, I am... I would not have a tip jar out because um, I wouldn't need to. But um, I do appreciate you guys that have been supporting me. You guys have been really awesome, and I really do um, appreciate it. With that said, um, there's my email address on here. And as soon as I can get this cat off my lap, I'm going to <laughs> turn it over <laughs> to Kurt so that I'm going to stop sharing. And Kurt, you should be able to grab that, and you should be able to go. And I'm going to mute myself and let you take it away. All right. Trying to get my, where to go. I'm like you, I've got too many, too many uh, windows open. That's, that probably means you're a Mac person. Because Windows people tend to not do that as much. All right. Um, Suzanne, thanks a lot for having me. Um, this is, uh, you know, I, I, we love doing, getting together with growers, talking about different stuff, and it's been uh, kind of a challenge. You know, not a lot of opportunities to do that live. So um, I think it's been fa it's fantastic that you're doing these these Zoom meetings and getting people, um, you know, into the. Oop, Su Suzanne, you got to open up the uh, the screen share for me. Um. You know, it's funny, I, I've got a little bit on the bucket, but you know, that, that bucket thing, um, the story behind it is that, that Becker Underwood came to us and asked us to make something because they were having oh. trouble. And so- Did I, hold on, did I mess you up? Are you, do you have it back now? I do not have, well, you're, you're, it says host, in, host disabled screen sharing. Okay, hold on a second. Let me uh, more make host. 
Okay, I'm making you the host. Okay, that'll work. Okay. Um, so we, uh, you know, at, when <laughs> Becker Underwood, before they were bought by BASF, came to us and asked us to, um, to make something like that. And the challenge was, you know, they basically said, hey, we want you to take a little air pump and we want you to pump it into a, into some type of apparatus that creates bubbles. And we tried for about a year and a half on that before realizing that the problem that they were having, one is that any apparatus like that creates, you get a shadow underneath whatever is creating the bubbles. So stuff could get caught underneath there. And two was that when you pump air and you try and make little bubbles out of it, you're compressing it. And when you compress it, you heat it. And so the water temperature would get up to about 100 degrees really fast. And so we finally figured out that we could use a passing, air, passing water stream and inject air into it. And we get great levels of oxygen as a result. Now, it, now it's working great. And the other result then is we can use it for agitation as well. So you can turn off the air and not have to, you know, say you want to agitate some fertilizer or something in there or another drench. So, okay. Um, DRAM has been around for... 80 years, almost, one more year. Um, and we started off by creating watering tools. Our original product that we developed was the 400 AL water breaker, you know, just main, mainly for hand watering of plants. Um, since then, we've developed a dozen different types of watering tools, all hand watering, but we moved into irrigation. We moved into air movement. We've now moved into complete water management, but then Spray equipment was something that came in about 50 years ago, 45, 50 years ago. And since then, we've tried to develop a complete line. And the reason we do that is we kind of use spray equipment like tools in a toolbox. Um, you don't have one screwdriver. You don't have, you know, you got a hammer. You got all these different tools. But quite often, you have more than one of the same kind of tool because they all do different things. There's benefits, you know, I can, I can turn a Phillips with a flathead screwdriver sometimes. It's not the best way to do it. I can pound a nail with a, with a monkey wrench like that, but it's not the best way to do it. Getting the right tool for the right job is important. And so all these different pieces of equipment have really benefits, but also detractions to them. So you need to, you know, when we look at how spray equipment fits into a different facility or different, diff different types of growing operations, so much of it has to do with, you know, you've got to look at the, the crop, you've got to look at the pest that they're targeting, you've got to look at the type of chemicals that they're trying to apply or pesticides that they're trying to use. Um, you have to look at logistics. You know, that's a huge part of it is the logistics behind it. So we do a wide variety of equipment, um, starting in the hydraulic range. You know, we do some basic hydraulic spray equipment, um, this is an MSO. One of the goals, one of the things that I really want to get out of this is explain the types of equipment to everybody and not just really focus as much on DRAM. I mean, we've got a wide range. Our philosophy is that we have a full range, um, but I want to explain what you need to be looking for in any piece of equipment, even if it's not ours. You know, there's, there's things that we put into this type of equipment that's extremely important. Um, this is a very small package. It's 20 gallons. One of the things that we do is we take solution from the bottom. It gets sucked from a sump well. A lot of, you know, off the shelf type things, you're going to drop a solution line down in the tank. The problem with that is you don't get all the, the stuff picked up well. Um, this is a fairly entry level piece of equipment, although it is very high pressure. It's 500 PSI. Um, one of the things that makes this entry level though is that it, it doesn't have great agitation. Um, because the pump size, you know, we're trying to keep it a small manageable pump that can fit on a small cart. It doesn't, it has agitation or bypass only when you're not spraying. And so every now and then you kind of need to shake this little thing to keep it going. Depends on the kinds of products that you're putting into it. Um, but it, that's, that's probably the one thing about this machine that, that, um, you know, you need to, you need to pay attention to couple different gun options available for this. Like I said, it's adjustable up to 500 PSI. And the up to is a really important part of any piece of spray equipment. When you're looking at sprayers, 
one of the things I'm going to talk about is the need for higher pressures. Higher pressure is going to give you the ability to atomize the spray into finer droplets. Finer droplets are going to cover the plant better. And it's going to do it in a way that you're going to have less runoff because the finer the droplets, if they're not recombining, they tend not to run off the plant as much. So the one thing, though, when we talk about variability of pressure, it's really important to have something that you can use lower pressure because there's sometimes when we don't want really fine atomization. There's sometimes when we don't want to overspray, um, you know, Depending on the, the types of things you're growing, we might have plants where we want to use a plant growth regulator, but other plants that don't require that. We might have pesticides that are applicable to one crop and not to another, registration on one crop, not, for, not another. We see this very often in the ornamental side of the business where someone might be growing impatiens and herbs in the same greenhouse. And selectability and preventing drift from going from one crop to the other is important pressure can have an impact on that. If I'm trying to sprench the soil, um, I want to get a soil coating, you know, there's certain insecticides where that's, that's a technique. If you use too fine of a spray, it's not going where you need it to go. So avail adjustability of pressure is always going to be important when we look at spray equipment. From there, we move up to a larger piece of equipment, the Hydra. And this is probably one of the most common machines that we've been selling now um, for hydraulic sprays. It's bigger um, and it depends, you know, that the, the challenge is it's 50 gallons. So it starts at that point, but this has incredible agitation. It has four gallon a minute output, which allows you to actually drench with it. The gun doesn't put out four gallons a minute. Um, you've got a variety of tips. It comes with a gun that only puts out about a minute, a gallon and a half, but we can put higher volumes and we can put lower volumes out by swapping the tip in this. Um, the difference between this machine and the MSO, like I said, the MSO is our very, as our entry level type of machine. And it's, it's a fantastic machine. It's meant for small areas. It gets ext extremely high pressure, really fine atomization, but there's things that it can't do. It can't drench. It doesn't have great agitation. When we look at our hydro line, um, we can keep things, even real stubborn products, some of the bio-rational pesticides, we can keep them in suspension really well with this type of system. Um, part of it is that we, you know, we use a bypass agitation where any of the solution that's not being sprayed returns back to the tank. When we have a, a four gallon a minute output on the pump, and that's at the electric, we do have gasoline versions of this where that, that output almost doubles. Um, but when you have four gallons a minute going out of the pump and a gallon and a half going out of the gun, two and a half goes back to the tank per minute to agitate the tank. Pump size is really important. So when you're looking at spray equipment, you want to look at the, the pump output, not just the spray gun output, because it's that pump output that allows us to give that really good agitation. There's other spray equipment in the market that only puts out about two and a half gallons a minute out of their pump. If they're putting a gallon and a half out with the gun, that means only one gallon per minute goes back to the tank, and that just doesn't provide a lot of motion in the tank to be able to recirculate that. Um, some of this, yeah. Sure. So one thing I want to point out, because a lot of people are having to drench these days microbials mm -hmm. for root aphid management, possibly. So is something like this good to keep all your, because the fungal spores we know settle out pretty readily in, yes. in the water. So yeah. So your agitation with this is going to be phenomenal. And part of the reason that, the hat, that we do that, um, I don't have a good picture of in this presentation, but if you look along like the bottom of this tank, basically there's two feet that are like lines across the bottom. And then there's a bar between those. It's kind of like an H shape in the bottom. And in the center of that H is a sump well where all the solution eventually drains to. So you siphon out everything from there. What we do to keep this in, in suspension, a lot of a lot of agitation systems just dump the water right back in the side of the tank or maybe from the bottom, they try and get it so it creates a circular motion in the tank. What we do is we put a bar along that bottom and then we put a nozzle at each of those feet on one side of the tank. And then we spray across those feet so that the solution rotates upward. That does two things. One is it sweeps the bottom of the tank, keeping, like you said, spores and things that are gonna settle to the bottom. A lot of those chemistries have a carrier or something like that, and you need to, you need, you know, 
you want to keep that all thrown into the into the tank and mixed up. The other thing it's going to do by throwing the solution this way, you tend to we we're trying to make a counter pattern to this because this is what happens when you suck solution through a hole in the bottom of the tank. It creates a vortex. If you do that, you can actually draw air into the pump, which it can damage some pumps, but it, at a minimum, it's going to reduce. It's going to suck air in, and you're going to get a, a loss of pressure for a second. So by 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 agitating this way, it's trying. It's preventing that at the same time that it's keeping doing a better job. Now, with some of those microbials or some of the the products like that, one issue can be filtration. So you know, if, if we've got to make sure that we don't filter out all those good guys, we put our filter right on the back of this, so it's easy to get at. Um, we do that for two reasons. One is I want you to be aware that there's a filter. Um, if it's tucked away somewhere, you tend to forget that it's there. And then you get a tank full of stuff and you realize that you didn't clean it the last time or the last five times. And that screen's kind of opaqued over and nothing comes through. So we put the filter in the back so that's very easy to access and visible. At the same time, we've got a valve right in front of it because we know you're going to forget to clean it even because we put it there even if we put it there. So you're gonna be able to turn that valve off and not have the tank drain down to that level if you open it. If you're using some of those microbial products, you may need to remove that filter. Um, there are a number of products that need to be applied and you know you can't have more than say a 50 mesh filter, which means this is too big, this one's too fine. You're gonna to need to remove that filter. We're okay with that, however, you need to really, really flush this well when you're done. We want to make sure, you know, that none of the particulate is left in that pump um, after you've made it such an application. So here's a, you can kind of see how this thing works. Um, really nice, fine spray, good distance. One of the things that's really important to note with this spray gun, that's the finest pattern. And it's a very forward momentum pattern. We're throwing it in a single direction. There's a lot of spray guns out there that at their finest pattern get a really, really wide pattern. And what happens is you're not, most growers find they don't get the distance they want out of it. And so they coarsen the spray. They, they angle the spray forward, which makes bigger droplets. We use a gun, This we don't make that gun. It comes from Italy, um, but it's a very good gun because of the directionality of it. You know, for what we're trying to do in a greenhouse indoor facility, we've got some distance to cover. That that distance of spray is going to be important um, when we're looking to you know cover a crop well. So really, between those two sprayers, you know, it's going to come down to quite honestly size for a lot of people. Um, they're both 500 psi. The MSO is 20 gallons, and for a lot of you know a lot of small to moderate sized facilities, that's enough. You may not need more than 20 gallons. You can get up to 150 feet of hose from that, but the pump output might limit you with some of the products because it is only half a gallon a minute. And so you don't get a tremendous agitation with that. You can't drench with that. Um, there are a number of wheel options for this. We can go with pneumatics. We can, uh, you know, um, and we actually have a gasoline version of this as well. Where the Hydra also being 500 PSI, it has four gallons a minute on an electric pump so that we can drive really good agitation, but we can drench with this as well. Um, there's smaller and bigger tank options, 50 up to 200 gallons. This is really, really good agitation. Um, and then if we've got versions of this for outdoor use, we've got versions of it for indoor use, um, meant to be kind of the do everything type sprayer. You know, what we, you know, growers a lot of times will ask us what type of sprayer should they start with? Um, hydraulic sprayer is always something that every grower is going to need. We're going to talk a little bit more about fogging in a minute, um, but fogging has some limitations in that you, you can't get things wet with it typically. Um, you may have space limitations if you're growing in open sidewall facilities or, or more open spaces, you know, fog doesn't work real well. Um, that said, it can do a lot of jobs. It just won't do all the jobs. Whereas a hydraulic sprayer, you can get by doing a lot of different jobs with the one piece of equipment. Um, you know, you can target spray and spray just a portion of the area. You can spray the whole place if you have to. You can drench with it. Um, just a really good way to basically cover plants. So we do have another version of a hydraulic sprayer. This is our BP4. Um, 
This is a little four gallon battery powered backpack. And what makes this unique compared to a lot of spray equipment is the pressure. This ramps up to, it's a variable pressure from about 10 up to 150 PSI. You won't find other backpack sprayers that go that high. And that's, that's, the, that's our, our primary intent in developing this machine was to offer higher pressure. Um, the reason for that is again, when we can pressurize a hydraulic spray with more pressure, we can generally create finer droplets. Finer droplets do a better job of coating the plant. Um, we participated in a study with Ohio State University, their, their um, agricultural research and development station in Worcester, Ohio, a number of years ago. We challenged them to try and use less product per acre. Um, you know, a very common application rate or volume in greenhouses is 100 gallons per acre. Um, we've always taken exception to that because that doesn't take into account crop height. You know, it doesn't take into account crop density, um, type of crop. And so that, that recommendation that's always been out there has just been a little odd to us. We always basically said you've got to use the amount of pesticide or solution required to actually cover your crop. The, the study that we did with them, we basically challenged them to use finer and finer nozzles and try and get an effective spray starting at 100 gallons and dropping down. And what they found, they, used, they did this on point studies, and what they found is by using a really fine spray and trying intentionally to not run it off the plant, get a really nice quick coating, not overdo it, not overwet the plant, they were able to get down to 30 gallons an acre with the same amount of efficacy. What that means, that's a third of the product that they were putting on the crop. That was a third of the time that it would take to put on the, on the crop. It ended up having very little runoff as a result. So when we talk about finer droplets, it, it, it comes from the idea that if we can use finer droplets, we end up doing a better job of covering the plant. We waste less product. Um, we take less time to do it. So with a backpack sprayer, you know, a lot of people think a lot of times of the pump up type things, um, you know, those are about 30, 40 PSI. This is four to five times more pressure than those. And that can give you much better atomization, much better coverage as a result. Now, it's also nice because it's battery operated. You don't have to do the pumping thing, um, which, you know, isn't a lot of fun. This one uses actually Makita drill batteries. So you can just pull these things in and out. If you got, if you've got, you know, you can get a whole set of them and a charger and just keep going. Um, battery's going to last for about 45 minutes on one full charge. Good indicator on there. You've got a, 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 a variable knob that'll allow you to adjust the, the pressure, but you get a really fine spray with this. Hello. That's on. There we go. Um, just really, uh, Again, like I said, you can get a very fine spray with it. If you just look at this, the way that that spray is compared to a lot of backpack type sprayers, you can see you get a much finer result. Again, though, the variability. If I want a sprench, I can turn that down. This type of equipment is really nice because you can, you know, stick one on your back and go do a spot treatment and go find, you know, go hit specific targeted areas without, um, how, without hauling the big sprayer in there. All right. So before we move on to that, let's. Yeah, there was a couple questions real quick. Um, okay. Even though we were going to do some at the end, but uh, yeah, somebody. Uh, yeah. Uh, buh, 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 buh. What was stop topic? Type, people are typing and it keeps pushing the questions up. Um, what is the optional lance used for? So, the optional lance is, is has really two features that are nice. One is in, it's extendable, so comes at about uh, twenty four inches and extends out to about forty some forty two. It has a ring on the end that has that has five little jet nozzles that are all angled slightly outward, so. Instead of a gun where I'm gonna aim it and I'm gonna get a spray that's, that's ma mainly directional, this is more like a wand. Um, really nice 
for over the top side application, but even better, I like sticking it between plants to spray up. It really depends on what you're trying to target. It's also a really good tool for sprenching. So you wanna spray into the soil. Um, it has a quarter turn valve on it instead of a trigger, which allows you to control the flow or the output. Um, that's nice because when you adjust, you can, with, that, with both those sprayers, you can adjust the pressure, um, but you can also adjust the volume with that so that it allows you to really control where the spray goes and, and also control the type of spray, if it's finer or if it's more coarse. And I will say that the sprinch is used quite a bit for nematode applications on smaller plants where the nematodes are applied kind of through the plant canopy that end up down in the soil because you can infect adult Western flower thrips with nematodes on the foliage, um, but we generally want to get the most nematodes into the soil uh, to target the pupa in the soil. So that's kind of where that sprinch is used. Once your plants are bigger, it's not used, but when they're, you know, under a foot or foot and a half, that's about when that, that method is, is used regularly. Yeah. Um, and now, some... one thing that's important with that, again, that variability of pressure is important because you don't really want to be applying nematodes over 300 PSI typically. So we yeah. need to be able to drop that pressure down so that we're not shredding Shredding. Them. <laughs> that's the exact word is shredding and that's exactly. what happened it's like trying to shove spaghetti through a colander with a filter at you know 200 miles per hour it yeah. just it just shreds them makes a mess yeah but um uh so okay that was for on there, Are there any um, other questions well uh henry did you want to ask your question real quick since we're here uh yeah um i'm just wondering i have the hydra the hydra sprayer Okay. And I'm just wondering, um, what's the best, like, how, how far away from the plant should I be standing when I'm spraying it? I have that gun that can't move it. So, how are you growing the crop? We're, they're all on benches. They're all okay. rolling benches. Yeah. How tall? I'll say two and a half to three feet. Okay. So, you're going to have to kind of reach to get over the top. Yes. I typically hold the gun upside down if that's the case, so that I'll put the trigger up here mm -hmm. so the gun comes out like this um i like do it because a lot well it, it depends on what you're trying to do but most of the time you're trying to come in from the top down or from an angle um generally not straight down at the plant but i like about a 25 to 30 degree angle to the crop because you can get into the side that way which is going to get you up underneath the leaves better um okay so coming in and doing something like this should how, how wide are the benches there's just four feet Okay. So yeah. I would probably be angling out in front of you. you you're going to get a really good, at, at, with that kind of crop, you're probably going to get a really good spray at about five to eight feet. Okay. So I probably wouldn't spray directly across you and I wouldn't spray directly next to you. I'd spray out kind of in an arc, if you think, okay. you know, from about five feet to eight feet in front of you just maybe maybe to make like a five to six foot arc in front of you in that okay. crop and just keep going like this as you back out if you get the problem is if the if you change your distance too much with a hydraulic spray um i got a really good slide for this that i didn't include in here but you need to think about a spray cloud off of a gun really has two components you've got the propulsion part which is basically from the nozzle out and that's what's pushing all the spray forward. And then you've got the diffusion part. And what's happening there is that spray cloud is now encountering other forces. It's, it's encountering friction and it starts to, the droplets start to peel off and go all different directions. That's what we wanna hit the plant with because now I'm coming in from multiple angles which is gonna get us better coverage over the leaf. If I hit it with the propulsion part, I tend to push the plant away. I lay the plant over. So you want to look at, you know, like I said, that really for that gun starts at about five feet. So I'd look to try and keep a five to eight foot arc and just keep aiming it all the same time at that same distance. If you, you know, too often we see people spray really close to them and then really far away in the same pattern or in the same spraying. And what ends up happening is it, it, it because it's a conical spray. If, if I've got a pie wedge like this and I spray the plants at the closer side, I'm putting the same amount of liquid in a much smaller area than if I do further away and I've got that pie wedge has widened out. 
So you change your coverage, you change how it interacts with the plant, how it coats the plant. So keeping the same distance to the target is, is generally what I recommend. Okay. How about, what if I try to spray it underneath it? If your plants are spread enough, it depends on how tight your, 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 your plants are. Sometimes you can kind of batter things if you're trying to go through. If you are going to do that, if it's only if, because, well, if you're it's a four foot, if it's a four foot wide crop and you shouldn't have any problem getting a couple feet into that. Um, I would probably spray seven or eight feet out in front of you to do that. So it'll okay. push its way through the canopy and then come in from the other side as well. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, keep going. All right, now we're going to move into fogging. Um, Dram makes a number of different types of foggers. Um, the most common, certainly for indoor, is going to be the auto fog, which is this guy. This is a bigger version of that. We make several sizes of this. This is an aerosol generator. What's happening is you've got a you've got compressed air, which is being pumped through a nozzle that creates a low it creates a low pressure system or open it placed in that nozzle which siphons the chemistry in and then it's atomized by that by that shearing of the air we create about a five micron droplet with this so your hair is about 100 microns in diameter if we take a droplet that is about say 100 microns, so the same size as your hair, which is the, about the edge of hydraulic spraying. Bigger than that is typically like a hydraulic wet spray. Smaller than that tends to be fog. If we take a droplet that's this big and we take the liquid contained in that and we make five micron droplets out of it, we're going to create about, we're going to create about 19,000 droplets with the same amount of liquid. So what's happening is we're creating much more, we're creating the ability to cover much more surface area when we fog. Um, when we look at these types of machines, basically the idea is we're releasing an aerosol into the space. We're spreading that aerosol around the space and allowing it to generally settle into the plants. For these types of systems to work, you generally want air movement to help laterally move the spray through the facility. Um, the machines themselves often create a good amount of air. So the way that these work is we have basically ranges of size that these will cover um, with by themselves or with additional HAF fans in the greenhouse. Now airflow with these is really critical. Um, they're, you know, in fact, as a result of this machine, DRAM about 25 years ago got into and started developing and designing horizontal airflow systems. Um, because we saw how poorly designed systems would affect the crop coverage. So we got into fans to make these systems work. And as a result, now we do fans to make other things in the, in the crop work for, you know, help even temperature to help aid in transpiration, even this. Um, but if you don't have fans that are set up right, this can be a problem. So depending on how your, how your HAF is set up, how your, you know, vertical fans don't work with this type of a system because it's moving this way and we're trying to move this way. Um, so you may need to turn off, depending on what your airflow fans are, oscillating fans don't work with this type of system. So depending on what you're doing, those really can't count for airflow to make one of these things work. You may need to turn systems like that off if that's what you have for air movement. Um, these are the different versions of that. Um, the most common, you know, for smaller areas is the mini auto fog. Um, this one's really nice because it, it kind of looks like an IV stand. You can raise this up, which generally is going to help get it above the canopy, which is our goal with this type of machine. We want to be spraying. We do not want this aimed at plants. We want this to be spraying out into the most open air space in this, in the facility so that it, ha it can travel and spread around in the room. Um, if, it's, if it's impeded in any way, that's going to affect how it covers. So we wanna make sure that you leave open airspace for this to work. 
Placement of these things is really critical, putting them in the right spot. You know, if you've got one of the ones with a fan on it, we need 30 feet behind it, be it for it to be able to draw air into the system. And then where you're putting it, as I said, is it's a very important to get it above into the most open air space. So like in an ornamental greenhouse, you've got hanging baskets, we want it in between there. Growing on the ground, we want it to sit above that crop. If we're growing stuff on benches, again, we want it to sit above that crop. Um, Taller crops, you know, the, the video I showed you was actually a pepper crop. You know, we actually put that in the truss of the greenhouse to make it work well. Um, so there's, you know, placement is something that we can always help with. And, and one of the things that's really important, if I go back to this chart showing the, the sizes here, this is best case scenarios, okay? So if you look at one of these things, say, oh, that'll work for me. Let's talk about it first because there's, you know, any impediment to air movement, the types of HAF you've got, things like that are going to imp impact that. Um, so these are good numbers to start with, but it may be smaller than that if, you know, depending on, depending on the crop, the density of the crop, the height of the room, um, you know, you need airspace for this to work. So from there, we move into thermal fogging. And I'm gonna take just a quick second with it just so everybody's aware of this. It's not, I mean, we, we do have a lot of people um, growing in greenhouses with this. I really don't recommend this indoors. So if you're growing in a greenhouse, this is a great tool um, independent of the crop. But if you, when you're taking it into a building, this is a jet engine. That's why we, we generally don't recommend it indoors. What's happening here is I've got a little carburetor here. I got a gas tank back here. See this black ball? I've got a fuel valve. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to push down on that ball. That's going to force air and gas past a, a spark plug, igniting it. And in this chamber, I'm going to get about a thousand little explosions per second. This is the V1 rocket. This is exactly the, the, the type of system that Germany used early in World War I. It, it is it basically you're creating propulsion out this barrel. Some of the air bleeds off of this carburetor, pressurizing this tank. The tank pushes the solution up to a valve. When you open that valve, it allows the solution up to these nozzles where that blast of exhaust is going to atomize it and propel it. We've got five different engine sizes of this, the largest of which can throw the fog 400 feet. Um, and treat, you know, an acre in four minutes. We've got that largest one right now. I shouldn't be telling you this. Is fogging the Staples Center for with disinfectants. We've got, you know, these machines. All the stuff that I'm showing you right now is also very applicable for applying sanitizing products. The auto fog that I just showed you, we've got those in a couple airports where they're fogging the airports at night after all the planes have left. Nobody's in there. They set them off with, with a variety, mostly um, oxidizers, but a variety of different products to sanitize the site after people have been in there. Um, the, the nice thing, this thing is, the reason this is important is because it is incredibly fast. There's re that's, that's where, you know, I mentioned there's people that'll choose different tools. That auto fog and this pulse fog are, very similar in what they do in the crop. They create a droplet that's very similar. Um, they coat the crop very similarly. The pulse fog does it a whole lot faster than the auto fog. The auto fog's automatic. I set a timer, I leave, I go home. Seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, it turns on. The pulse fog, I need to be there, but I'm gonna be there for a couple minutes. And so the advantages of that, I've got growers that have used, that'll use the same machine in the same greenhouse at different times of the year. So you've got, you know, February, March, that auto fog's great. They're not harvesting things. They're fogging into the greenhouse at night. Nobody's around. They can close all their vents at night because it's cold outside. We roll around into May and June, and now the vents are open until 8, 9. Um, if they start fogging with the auto fog at 8 or 9, it has to, you know, when you, with these pesticides, you have a, the reentry interval starts when you are done applying the product. So if it's a two hour application, it's 11, a, 11 p.m., you got a 12 hour RUI pesticide, it's 
11 a.m. that you're 11 a.m. that you're allowed back in that facility. You use the pulse fog, it's 10 minutes. So it's instead of that not two hour application time, it's a 10 minute application time, lets you back into the facility a whole lot sooner. So there's different reasons for each of these tools. This machine's advantage is speed. Now, unfortunately, it has a couple problems. One is it's really loud. It is a jet engine. Number two is that it's hot. We make a version of this that has a second set of tanks. This does not do it justice noise-wise. It comes with ear protection. So you see this one, I got two valves. I've got two tanks here. I've got two sets of nozzles here. What's happening is one tank is just plain water and it feeds into that first set of nozzles. That will cool the exhaust enough that when I apply the pesticide up here, the heat's not an issue. Now for most regular insecticides and fungicides, that's not a problem. Where it really comes into play is when you're using some of the biorational stuff that is heat sensitive. Any of the Bavaria products, Bavaria Bassiana will be damaged by heat. You need this version of the machine to apply that type of product. Um, there's a number of products, Cease, uh, you know, any, you know, so Bacillus subtilis, there are various products that are alive. You're generally going to want the bio version of that machine. But like I said, this is really a greenhouse application. It's probably not something you're going to use in an indoor facility. The For, cold fogger real, is now. So yep. people, some people have been asking, and I kind of wanted to ask you to say it too, because so what kind of products like would you want to use? Because I know a lot of people here are cannabis or hemp growers mm -hmm. and so they don't have a lot of access to a lot of the traditional ones there are some ornamental growers on here but um if you were going to be using a lot of like bavaria microbials bacillus you know things like that um are there any of the equipment that you should definitely not be using or so if you can kind of mention that about which products sure. kind of or product groups for just like you did with your jet engine <laughs> Right. So there, so the auto fog really can handle any of them um, unless it's so thick that it won't go through. But typically we find ways to make that work. Cease and mill stop is a good example. Okay. You got, you got a combination of issues. One, heat sensitive. So the auto fog will handle the, the cease just fine. The mill stop problem is that it is not a very soluble product. And so we actually worked with, um, we worked with BioWorks to come up with appropriate rates for fogging for those products. That's actually on a forum that we have. BioWorks has a tech sheet on that. Um, DRAM, we have a really good relationship with most of the pesticide manufacturers. And so we tend to work with them when we see problems to make sure that those products can be applied. Um, so like I said, the, the, the auto fog, the considerations you have with any machine are going to be a couple. One is temperature. So the pulse fog really has a problem there. We've made a version of that that can handle bio-rational products or living products, heat-sensitive products, because it, the water, basically it's a water-cooled exhaust. You have to worry about filtration. Any of these bio products typically have filtration issues. They're, they tend to be chunkier, thicker. You know what? You don't want to filter out the good stuff. So you've got to look at filtration and where that comes into play. Um, another issue that we're going to talk about more towards the end of this is, you know, corrosivity. You know, the, the, the types of pesticides that are available to anybody that's growing hemp or cannabis are pretty minimal. And so those tend to be things like oxidizers. They tend to be biorationals. They tend to be basic pyrethrum-based products. Um, they tend to be oils and soaps. So the hydraulic sprayer, you're going to oil and soap, no problem. The auto fog with an oil and soap, um, we do see some efficacy, but you don't get its main mode of action typically. So most of those products are suffocants. And when you're putting a fog out, it tends to be, you're going to put a really thin layer of that product very evenly over the crop 
but it's going to be a really thin layer. It's kind of like trying to smother somebody with your grandmother's old knit crocheted blanket. It's going to be really porous. You're not going to suffocate an insect with that. Now, the good thing is most of those oils and soaps and botanical oils all tend to have another mode of action, which is the desiccating action. Um, it tends to affect their chitin, which at, at a minimum doesn't feel good. So the bug's going to jump around a lot more and be active as a result. But quite often that, that desiccation action can be efficacious even in a fog. We just gen generally don't promote it. We know there's some products that work better than others in that mode. Um, so we get to the cold fogger and here we got one of those issues with bios where there's filters. You've got a filter back here and you've got a filter in the gun because it's got a really fine tip. If you take this filter out of that gun, this can get clogged. But if you don't take that filter out of this gun, all of those goodies are going to get stuck right here if it, if it tends to be something that's bigger and chunkier. Um, a lot of these biorational products that are on the market come with some type of a carrier, clay or bran, that needs to actually, you know, you're, you're going to put that in a, in a bucket, you're going to mix it, you're going to let it settle for a while so that the, the bacteria or the fungal spore releases from that carrier. You're going to kind of stir it up, let that clay or whatever it is settle, and then you're going to de decant the liquid off. Um, it's hard to prevent some of that carrier from getting in the tank. That stuff getting into the tank generally doesn't react well with pumps and spray guns. And so you need to be careful of that. That's where the filtration, you have to be, you have to look at how those things are going to work. Most of those things, if you can do a good job of decanting, are going to work pretty well. So the cold fogger, like I said, has a filter here. And it does that because this is, this is a hydraulic sprayer, just like the Hydra or the MSO. But instead of 500 PSI, we're running at 3,000 PSI. What that does is, in combination with a very, very fine tip, it creates a very diffuse spray that has some really good oomph behind it. So it's really great at getting into the canopy with a really diffuse spray. Um, but, and the nice thing is without that, with, it, with the droplets being that small, there's really not a lot of mass to those droplets. So there's no force behind them. They don't cut things open. Whereas if you look at like a, we took 3,000 PSI and two gallons. This is putting out about a quart a minute. If you applied 3,000 PSI with, and, and applied a, about a gallon or two a minute, you have a pressure washer. And that's not something that we want to be using on plants. So it's, it's, the, it's the combination of the ultra fine tip as well as the higher pressure that's going to give you a very diffuse spray. And you can see really big faux pas in the, the way the guy's using this in this video, but it's one of the best videos I have because you can see how that spray fans out and it's very diffuse. Generally, we do not recommend you walk into the spray. We prefer that you back through, but you can see how that moves through that canopy. None of that's really getting wet because it's a very, very dry spray as you go. So this machine is really useful for even coating it's very quick. You're, you're basically using about one liter or one quart to a, cover a thousand square feet. So you have to move pretty quickly because it's putting that out in one minute. So you got to cover about a thousand square feet a minute with this. Um, it's not going to leave things wet. It's not going to be a very visible application. So you kind of got to trust that it's doing the job. You want to see leaves doing this um, and that will give you good coverage. One of the problems with this though, you know, is that it, it, this pump is because of the, the nature of its design um, is, is hard to make bulletproof. And so corrosive products, um, our experience with those on this, things like Oxidate, Sanidate, Zerotol, um, they are going to be a problem if you let them sit. And that's really something I'm going to say with our hydro sprayers, any sprayer that you use those types of products in, um, even if they're meant for it. So we make a version of our hydra that's, a, 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 that's got corrosion resistance in it. Um, you still want to immediately after being done with that machine, flush the thing really well with plain water. And that's because the longer those products sit in contact with the metals, they will have an impact. 
they will impact even stainless steel. They will impact nickel plated things. They will impact stuff that it should be able, that should be resistant to it. So you want to make sure that you are, um, are flushing very well after any use. So as I said, you, you know, something like the cold fogger, really nice because you can aim it. It's very directable, but you get an incredibly fine dry spray. So you're not over wetting the crop. Um, especially in indoor facilities, that's an important thing. Humidity becomes a, a concern. So, but you need to flush them really well if you're using oxidizers. And that's, so, like I said, that's something that we push with any spray equipment we have. So I have a question on that because I'm finding that a lot of cannabis growers aren't doing the, the triple rinse uh, to clean their tank kind of thing when they're done. But we also had a situation where a uh, cannabis grower was feeling their microbial testing Mm -hmm. and we looked at the water, we looked at everything, and it turned out the they had gotten bacteria into their spray tank. Sure. And so every time, even though they tried using bottled water to spray, they were still ending up with the bacterial counts. Um, so what can you clean your tank with to disinfect it that won't eat your tank? The tank I'm less worried about. So if you use, if you use basically any of the sanitizing products, in your tank, no, tank's not the issue. It's the well, metal parts that I'm worried about. But so even going through the nozzles. Zerothal. Right. So as long as you flush those through, you can run those through there to clean those types of, if there's, a, if there's an infection, you can clean that up. If it's in the pump, it's in the lines. That's, that's a good way to clean them up. But when you're done, then put plain water in and pump, it, pump the plain water through there to flush that stuff out. So it's not having prolonged contact with the metal surfaces. Um, okay. Otherwise, tank specifically, um, you know that if you've got a if you know the problems in the tank, and my guess is if it's in the tank, it's in the it's in the plumbing as well. Well, so, the problem was is water had come through from the city because they had an issue, but then the city mm -hmm. fixed it. So then the water was clean after that, but it right. got in there the one time. Yeah. And, and then it just, whatever kind of bacteria it was, which they were failing their tests. Because again, this is something I never had to deal with with ornamentals before. No, we, yeah. And, that and, and metals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the heavy metals. In fact, that's been in the, the chat box too, talking about, you know. We're, we're going to um, get there. Corrosion. We're, we'll so. get to heavy metals in a minute. Okay. Well, then I'll um, let you go on. So, yeah, cleaning is really important with any piece of equipment. And, and it's going to make a big difference. You spend a good bit of money on a piece of equipment to make sure that it's going to do the job. You need to make sure you're cleaning it well after use. Another thing that's really important, when you, when you do clean it and you're all done, then release all the pressure from the system. So you're, like it's a hydraulic sprayer or it's the cold fogger. If you leave that under pressure, that, actually, that pressure will actually increase the activity of those oxidizers. So you want to make sure that you relieve any pressure from the, the, the spray line um, off the pump. You do that by returning the regulator down, pull the trigger a couple times to make sure there's nothing, there's no pressure still on the line. Okay. Um, one piece of equipment that kind of spans both sides of the fog spray debate. This is kind of a combination of the cold fogger and the pulse fog or the auto fog. In that it, so it's an air atomizing system. I got a little blower, got a cord, five liter tank, and this nozzle, this is the key. If I can change this and put bigger or smaller nozzles in, and that's going to allow bigger or smaller droplets as well as higher outputs or lower outputs out of the gun. This thing is really nice because you aim it, you spray it where you want, or I can put a very fine tip in here and I can go fog a room with it. So like the auto fog or like the pulse fog, except that there's no heat, I can go fill a space with this or I can put a bigger droplet in it and I can aim it at plants. What's really nice about this is that in both instances, you're not adding a lot of water to the problem. So we don't see, you know, one of the big problems that we see with people spraying is they end up with botrytis and powdery mildew afterwards, no matter what they put on, because everything kind of stayed wet. Um, Fogs are great for, for preventing that because we don't see the plants really wet after the application. Um, this is a tool where you can go in and, and basically paint what you need to. It's got a, a, because of the air behind it, there's a lot of force, which is going to help drive it into the canopy. 
So here you can see this thing working. And you can see how it's rustling the leaves at about a 15 foot distance there. Turning them over, coming in from the side, trying to push them, you know, so that we get into the canopy. The, the idea with this, you know, as a directed spray, really nice because, you know, one of the things that, that we try and push is the ability to, to be directed and target areas that actually need more attention than others. A fog is great because you can treat a whole room, and especially that's really nice when you've got um, a disease outbreak or insect pressure that's gotten beyond control. But if you know where they're coming in or you know where, and you can, you can target them, you know, you can use a lot less product by targeting an area rather than the whole greenhouse. So like I said, this one is the one that you can, you can actually aim it up in the space with a much finer droplet, or you can aim it like most of that video showed. So Matt, I'm laughing because Matt is like, yes, I need that. He wants to know if he gets a discount code tonight for participating in the <laughs> webinar. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can do like the special bug lady discount. I'm not sure that we, we you know, it depends on where it's going to come from, but we might work something out. Um, Which I would never take. I don't take any kickbacks. I don't get no, any it would money just from. Because it, would be a, it would be a goodwill thing because you guys are all participating tonight. Yes, yes, but no, I'd get no kickbacks from DRAM. So just so you no, know, no. this is, I believe in the products and I've seen them work so well over the years, but we'll see what we can see what Kurt can do for you, Matt. So that goes through the majority of equipment that's gonna be used for spraying. Um, I've got a couple different pieces of equipment I wanna talk about after this topic though. For all of that equipment, one thing that's gonna be really important because of the crops that, the, that a lot of you are applying to Oxidizers are a big part of that, part of your crop protection. They're not anywhere near as much in other crops. We don't see oxidizers used as regularly in vegetables. We don't see it in ornamentals. And that's because they can use a lot of other stuff to kill, pat, to kill pathogens than what you can. And so we see oxidizer use very heavily in, in cannabis and in hemp. Um, all of, our equip, all of our equipment that I've shown you is designed or has versions that are meant that can be used with oxidizers. I already gave you the pitch on why you need to clean them out and how important that is. Um, it, it, and, I'll, and I'll hit it one more time. It's, you know, keeping this equipment from damage with these types of products is simply as, is, is as simple as flushing them when you're done. Um, you know, in fact, before we got into the cannabis space, before this really started cropping up, we didn't even make the corrosion resistant version of our Hydra because the oxidizers themselves won't do too much damage to the machine. What they will do is they'll strip lead out of brass. And nobody wants to spray lead in their pesticide applications. So that's really where the CRF version comes of that from that Hydra is, is it's, a, it's preventing heavy metal contamination. One of the things that's really important though when we talk about this is really we do not think RO water has a place in spraying your crops. And that is because RO is very corrosive itself. Um, it's often called hungry water. Reverse osmosis water is basically the universal solvent. Water is a very good solvent. It dissolves a lot of things, including a lot of metals and, metals and minerals. Um, and when you take all the ions out of it, it's hungry. It's looking for stuff to dissolve. Um, and it will dissolve. You can pull chromium out of stainless steel with RO depending on the, the type of, our, of stainless steel you use. So our, our standard stance is, and every tank that we ship has a little sticker right by the inlet of that tank saying no RO. Now that does not mean you cannot use RO water blended with your fresh water, but straight RO is not a good idea in any sprayer, ours or anybody else's, because of the damage that RO can pose to various metals, but more importantly, the types of stuff that it will pull out of those metals and put into your spray solution that you are now applying to a crop that you're being tested on for those types of metals. So 
we get that there's a lot of RO in use. Um, if you're going to use it, you need to add some ions back before you do. Very important. That one didn't generate any questions. <laughs> Normally, if I say that, people start to, to a bunch of guys growing with RO and they start getting questioning it. Well, I, I heard a collective sigh through the universe because <laughs> I, I mean, because I've been to a lot of places, they've invested in doing the RO systems. Um, yep. So, well, DRAM, one of the things that we do outside of this is water management. We sell a lot of RO systems. We actually try and talk a lot of people out of RO systems because generally, you know, if you, there's times when your water needs it and there's times when it doesn't. Um, we see it very heavily in use. A lot of the fertilizers have been formulated for use with RO water. Strip it all out and add what you want back. Um, in, in a lot of ag, that's, that's counter. You know, most people look at what's in your water and add what you need to. Um, but if you have RO, you should still have the ability to blend in some fresh water as well. And so that's what we would recommend is don't go straight, don't go straight RO. Go, go with something blended in. You don't have to mix your fertilizers with it. And it shouldn't be any issue. Now, if you have really bad water, and, and, and we've seen guys like in Nevada, parts of Colorado, Pueblo really has a bad problem. We've seen arsenic and things like that in the water, and you need the RO or you need something else to contain that. If that's the case, give us a call. We can help you with those things and still get your spray water to, to, to not have arsenic in it. Um, that's RO is not always the best way to deal with some of those things anyways. Somebody asked about ECA. Electrolytic water. Um, there's various versions of electrolytic water. Um, all of them can be typically applied with most of this stuff, although it is corrosive. So it kind of needs to follow the same regime as things like, um, as, as, as what you would with like oxid uh, oxidate or something like that. ECA is basically... The most common form is going to be sodium hypochlorite um, or, heart, or some systems will do hyper, will create hypochlorous acid. Um, it may adjust the pH of the product. Depends on the system that you're using. There's a, there's a couple different people that are providing those to the industry. Um, yeah, can be a good disinfectant. In fact, the, you know, the auto fog I mentioned that we've got some airports, that's what they're applying is ECA. They're applying electrolytic water to, to, the airports to sanitize them. It's a good sanitizer. So not a problem, just need to take the same precautions as you would with oxidate, sanidate, stuff like that. Okay. So as I said, flush always. All right, a couple, two different things I wanna talk about that are not standard pesticide application, but they are pretty important. Um, sanitation obviously in 2020 has gotten a lot it got a really big boost. Um, you know, we weren't selling foggers to airports before COVID-19. We were focusing very heavily on the greenhouse and, and ag side of the world. And um, we've sold a lot of equipment for sanitation as a result. Before that, though, I mean, we, we, so before coronavirus, we've had, we actually have been involved in sanitation for a long time. A lot of the equipment that you see in other industries like livestock, um, other vegetable crops, things like that. Sanitation is a big deal. You know, you're not just applying pesticides, but you're sanitizing between crops. And that's something that's, you know, the medicinal crops are also, you know, very big on. Sanitation is a very important thing. So one of the things we started pushing a couple of years ago was foam. We're not the people that started doing it. We actually, you know, have made foamers for about 20 years, but a big subset of our customer base, primarily the ornamental growers, no one ever used foam. Foam was not something, it, it was viewed as, ah, it's another sprayer I got to buy. I don't want to go do that. So we developed this nice little handheld pump up foamer. Um, we have bigger foamers as well, um, but we developed this to teach about foaming. It's only, you only fill it to about five liters. So a little more than a gallon. The re what happens here is, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can create a foam. The cheap ways typically aren't very good. You know, so what they do is you know, like the hose end ones, you screw it onto the end of a, of a regular garden hose and you go spray. Those create suds. And the reason they, they create suds is that you have basically a little siphoning system in there. It sucks air in. 
that's sucking in atmospheric pressure of air. Whatever is around you, that's what's pushing the air into that liquid. When we do something like this, we compress this, you know, it's a pump up sprayer, but we leave half of it or a little more than half of it open so that there's compressed air here. We compress this to 60 PSI. We have a mixing valve here that takes the liquid from the bottom and the air from the top and mixes it. That's what creates the foam. If I use 60 PSI, I can put a lot more air into that liquid, which gives me much thicker and richer foam. The result is we end up putting the product you know, onto surfaces and the result is that it sticks. So you look at things like algae on a wall or you look at surfaces that are, you know, that you need to sanitize, especially that are vertical or expanded metal benches or things like that. A good foam is gonna stick. The reason you want a foam to stick is because most of the disinfectants you're gonna use are improved with contact time. So the longer that it sits there, wet on that surface, the more activity you have of that disinfectant on that surface. You know, that was just algae falling off with just a hosing off with a little bit of zero tall sitting in there for five minutes. So hopefully your greenhouses and facilities aren't all that green, but if they are, that's a great way to clean it off. As I said, we make other versions of this. We make 20 gallon, 50 gallon, we make 100 gallon versions. These are all compressed air systems. You hook an airline up to this and this is gonna create a foam like this. So you can throw that and get things covered. See how that's actually covering that expanded metal? It's getting in there and kind of filling in the cracks. This is the, that application. This is before, this is after. That's what it looked like when they foamed it. Can you use any soap in that? Um, soaps, yeah, to a degree. The majority of what you're gonna be applying though, because you actually want some activity that's gonna go beyond, like if you're gonna try and get rid of algae, you want something that's a little more active. So things like Sanidate, Oxidate, um, Uptake, so the quaternary ammonia products, things like that, really effective this way. In fact, they're great because you don't need it, a, a foaming agent. Something like Sanidate, all the oxidizers typically need something added to make them foam. Well, I'm so, not worried about algae. I, okay. and I don't know how I didn't know about this. I'm glad we did this webinar. But my mind foam is party? like root aphid killer on walls. Okay, there you because, go. Because, I mean, I don't care about algae as much. I mean... Because, you know, the root aphids walk on the walls, and I'm always about, you've got to get a foamer to try to get the soap on the walls, um, and, a, a, you know, a soap or a detergent that yep. will stick and have enough contact with the aphids. Um, and a lot of states, because of restrictions on what you can use, they just can't, some states you can't even use an insecticidal soap. Sure. Um, so if you could use, you know, a detergent in that. One of the best things at foams, you throw some like Dawn dish soap in a tank. Yep. Oh man, you'll make really nice foam. Yes, we need to rebrand that as like the aphid wall killer, you know, and All right. uh, because that's one of the biggest things. You can treat your plants, but if the aphids are walking around everywhere because the root aphids do a lot of the walkabouts, that's perfect. Okay. Great. Yay. Another use, perfect. The other place where we think foam has a place, we haven't gotten enough work with the chemistry guys, um, is herbicides especially the ones that are labeled in the greenhouse or in the crop, because one of the big problems with any of those is if you, if you get too much atomization, you get some drift or volatility and they affect the crop above it or around it. If you can apply as a foam, you've got a visible indicator of where it's been and it doesn't have little wispy droplets that float around. It goes where you spray it and you can see that you hit what you hit and it sticks again, contact time. So that's the real advantage of any foam is the contact time that's created with it. All right, so the last one thing I wanted to hit on is the, is the, the, the aeration agitation bucket. Um, the, you know, Suzanne brought this up at the beginning. Um, we were asked a number of years ago by Becker Underwood to make this because nematodes, there was an issue, was keeping them alive and happy you know, you're buying those nematodes, you want them to be 
as healthy and happy as they can be when you put them out onto the crop. And so number one, they breathe oxygen. Number two, they, they are heavier than the water and they tend to fall to the bottom of the tank. So without something to agitate them and mix them in well, and without adding oxygen, they can start to suffocate in that tank. And so they become a lot less effective when you apply them. So what we've done is we've basically built a recirculating system. So there's a, there's a pump in the bottom of this. And what we did to save money as opposed to building some big box to put everything in, we took two buckets, we stuck them together, and in the, between the two buckets in here is where we have all the mechanical. Um, you have your power switch. We make this in a, an AC or a DC version. Um, both of them use the same power supply because they are all, they're actually all DC. We just use an inverter to run the AC version because we don't want 120, bucket, 100, 120 volts running into the bottom of a bucket of water. Um, we, so when you flick this thing on, it starts a pump which starts recirculating. So there's no stuff sticking out of the bottom of the tank that, that things can get caught underneath. And then you've got a switch. This is just a little air switch. We open it up and air gets siphoned into that stream. We can add oxygen to this. And with nematodes in the bucket, we can still keep saturation levels of oxygen in that tank. We turn that off and then we can use that to mix things. So you have to mix a fungicide for drenching or you have to mix um, a fertilizer you know, to go off your injector or whatever. This can help keep those things in solution um, so that they're not you know, settling out. You know, that's that's this is kind of a dual use piece of equipment. You can kind of use it either way. People um, are asking if you can use this for compost teas. To create a compost tea? I mean, like, can you brew compost tea? Where, Probably it? not. We don't get that. I mean, so, well, maybe. Um, we haven't tried it. I would... Be... The types of different equipment that I've seen for brewing compost teas, I mean, there's the homemade stuff, and then there's the ones that have a lot of onboard air. Um, you know, the big challenge with any compost tea is making sure it stays aerobic. So you don't want this to get, you don't want those to get anaerobic because then you start to get funky stuff. Um, I actually saw a compost tea trial when they were, what you know, California was banning methyl bromide and they were looking for ways to treat fusarium and they were looking at compost teas as a way to do that. And, um, they went and did a trial. This was on calla bulbs. And I was actually, a friend of mine made the compost tea brewer. And so I got him involved with these guys. And every one of the tea trials had fusarium and the other ones didn't because they weren't even, they didn't have any inoculum at all. For some reason, the compost, the, the fusarium got into the tea and it went aer anaerobic and it spread the stuff. So the challenge with that is I, I wouldn't recommend it just because I'm not sure that we're getting the, the, the type of mixing that you might want with an aerobic, with a general, with a good tea brewer. It depends on your compost and everything else too. I mean, there's so much, so many variables that go into making a good compost tea. Well, Tad, who can unmute himself instead of me <laughs> just reading, um, he said all about dissolved oxygen levels and not putting too many food sources to create anaerobic conditions. Sorry, Suzanne, exactly. compost tea question. Yeah, yeah, okay, Tad, fine. I mean, it's an important well, question. I mean, you're exactly right, Tad. You don't, I mean, you're right. Too much stuff in there can make it go anaerobic, but yeah, we can keep, we can keep saturation levels. Now we've only tested it with nematodes and it really depends on the oxidative demand. So we make systems that are, that deal with oxygenating water very differently. We use ozone as a tool to oxygenate water to also clean the water. One of the big challenges you see with any oxygenation system is that if you have too high of an oxidative demand, so lots of biology, they will use, that will use a lot of the oxygen dropping the levels, which can create an anaerobic condition. So good point. You don't want to put too much, too much stuff in. Okay. So quickly, you know, I wanted to mention that DRAM does, you know, water management in, in basically that means that we're taking the entire, from your source all the way to your plant. Um, we do air movement in indoor and, and greenhouse facilities. Um, 
really, like I said, that stems off of doing, uh, making sure fogging was working properly. Um, but as a result, we end up getting much better levels, uh, you know, much better transpiration, much better air movement, which is going to help homogenize temperature, CO2, humidity, pesticide fog. Um, and we do that in a way that we make sure that we're, we engineer it for, for the site so we make sure it works right. But I wanted to leave you guys with a couple resources that we have. Um, if you have questions, um, our website has a great uh, resource locator. So you can go to our commercial team and you can get all the information on the different guys in the different, different areas that you all live in. Um, you can always contact me off of that as well. But our website has a page that has contact information for each of our guys in the states that they cover. We also have a number of white papers, videos, and even a forum on our website so that, you know, like the white papers, I've, I've got a, we've got a really good one on selecting the right sprayer. So a lot of the stuff we talked about today gets a lot more in depth into particle size and things like that and why you want different particle sizes. Um, there's a lot of videos. Every machine that we have has videos of them running, but also a lot of them have training videos on how to use them. We have maintenance videos on different things, how to fix this, how to do that. Um, but then we also have this forum on our website so that if, you know, one of the things that we recognized a long time ago is that um, people typically aren't spraying during normal business hours. And so you get your sprayer out and you start, you know, messing around with it, you fill it up and something's not right. Um, the forum, the best thing about the forum is, in, in fact, ma the majority of questions are ones that we've actually posted and answered just based on conversations we've had. Customer asks this, we'll put that up there so that everybody else could go to that forum and search it and find that information. So you might find, you know, the answer to your problem there. And if you don't, you can post something and most of us, you know, get a, we'll, we'll get emailed that even at like nine o'clock at night. And if we can answer it, we try to, because we know if people are asking a question that's time sensitive, we want to be able to get back to them. But you'll find things on there about different pesticide uses. So I mentioned like cease and millstop. Those rates are all on our forum. They're on the BioWorks website as well. But if we work something out with a different, you know, that's, that's different than the way you would normally mix, that has some different considerations, we post it up there so that you're aware of it. Somebody asked about what about the the north of the border Canadians and uh, for sorry yes we have we have a team in Ontario um, we have four people that work out of our Ontario office but they cover the 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 whole country um, you can find them on that same page as well I didn't think about the Canadians in this conversation so oh I apologize oh, oh. I'm not Please. even in yes. that was I heard Chaz I didn't see him but I heard him squeaking a noise somewhere. Yeah, I said we exist. Yep. I, well, yeah, we've we've got we got four people working up in Ontario, and it, and and yeah, I didn't think about it from the terms of this this talk, but yes, there's you can reach that team through that same page on our website as well. I think Matt had a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks, Kurt. Uh, thank you very much for doing this tonight. Um, second of all, I wanted to I, I do thousand square foot rooms where I'm at, okay. and. Uh, so, and I have the backpack sprayer. Do you think that probably the turbo ULV would be best for that application with thousand square foot rooms? Um, they both can be useful in different ways. The, B, the backpack sprayer is going to give you a wetter spray, no doubt. The, the turbo ULV can speed things up. Um, you could treat the whole room just by waving it around over the crop with certain products. Otherwise, it's going to give you that ability to go and target specific things None of, neither of those two methods is going to get anything really wet, which is one of the benefits of it. So, right. I, I mean, I'm just trying to stack up my arsenal and I figured a, a, a cold fogger was something I really should probably add. So that was that, that turbo ULV would, would do that. Right. I, th I think that, you know, compared to the regular cold fogger, the one we call a cold fogger, I'd go with the turbo ULV. It gives you more versatility. And if it's only a thousand foot room, you know, one of the problems you're going to have with the, the hydraulic cold fogger is you have to run that room really to get through it because it's meant it's putting it out at a, at a rate of about a thousand square feet a minute. So you got to move quickly in there 
Um, but a thousand, if you're only doing a couple rooms, that's only a couple liters in that 20, in that 70 liter tank. So it's not going to be real good. You know, it's not going to give you, you're going to have almost too little solution in that tank. So yeah, the turbo UOV probably be a better option. Okay. Um, and just one thing I wanted to add for, for the whole group, uh, because I would have killed for this information a while ago. Um, uh, like one thing I have had success with, at least as far as testing goes in Michigan, and people can look that up, is I have uh, applied like a, a zero tall or something like that in the last couple of days of harvest. Um, even when I did have some powdery mildew and passed all my testing, just wanted to kind of, uh, with my DRAM backpack sprayer, just wanted to, to throw that out there to let people know that that was something that, that you know, really worked um, well for me, thank goodness. Um, and I have a, a biofoamer, not, not your guys's, but I'm sure your guys's works just as well. And I actually have foamed like live plants, um, especially sometimes the, uh, the little guys. And again, it worked totally well. I'm obviously not an expert. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. You should, you know, try a small sample size. Um, but uh, it, you know, no, no harm. I only saw, you know, benefits if I thought um, I, I was trying to... You mentioned Knock that out. I know Bio. I know BioSafe had a video for a while running on the internet. They were actually fo they were fogging. They were foaming flour. I was shocked, but that they, I think they had a problem. They were trying to clean up, and it seemed like it worked. I hear about a lot of people using Xerotol towards the end, especially the states that have much stricter microbial um, right. standards. Um, especially since they're not doing at again depends on the state and what kind of testing, but you know, the, the tolerance is so low and some of them aren't even pathog human pathogenic problems. It's just to minimize any risk of any of that. Yep. So, um, so. Yeah, and I didn't see, you know, I know that all the concerns, but as far as, you know, from, from one crop to another, I didn't see any real drastic changes in at least what my THC numbers came back as from one that I did not touch to one that I had to, you know, kind of like remediate there at the end. And, uh, but, you know, obviously those, you know, first time you do that and walk away, it's a couple of sleepless nights, right? <laughs> so anyhow, just wanted to share that with you. I've definitely seen it oxidate some of the heads of trichomes um, from over application of, of like xerotol type stuff at the end of harvest. That's what I'd be worried about is a little bit of crisping up, frying them a little bit, but. For sure. Well, I was at 30 mils a gallon and, and, and saw no, you know, no frying. But again, you have to, you know, try, <laughs> try one, one plant, give it a day or two and right. then come back. And, you know, but, but again, thank you very much. I appreciate everything. No problem. Thank you. Kurt, I did have a question um, for people that are smaller hobby growers. Um, and obviously they don't need the large equipment, if you just are a home hobby grower, because I get this question a lot and I never have a good answer. Um, and let's just say you have 10, 20 plants. Is there a, a, a starter easy sprayer when you're not a big professional grower that you can point kind of in that direction? Because I don't think you guys make anything for something that small really, or do you? Other than that backpack sprayer. Yeah, because that's still pretty big i mean again i know some it's people robust but it's only four gallons i mean you can fill that with a two gallons and and not have any problem it's it's the challenge you know the difference between it and you can go buy stuff like that on the market that's not going to be really two things it's gonna it's probably not gonna be as robustly built no it's gonna break i more, yeah I more importantly <laughs> it's not gonna have the pressure and that's where that's where that machine is it really excels is that it's yeah. you know 150 PSI for a pump for a backpack sprayer. If you can compare that to a pump up, we, when we first started with that machine, we took them out on the road to show growers and had th that were backpack sprayer users. And all you had to do was pull the trigger and the guy would kind of drop his jaw and say, yeah, I want it. Cause it, it, it just does such a much finer job. Um, not only that, but you have more force behind it. So it penetrates into the canopy. It's a combination of force and smaller droplets that just does a better job. Okay. Hey, Kurt, can I jump in to piggyback off that question? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, what if like, you know, a lot of people just don't have uh, a budget for that BP4. Like it's a great sprayer, but it, you know, it's good, good quality, costs money. 
what would you recommend for someone that, you know, might be in more of that like pump sprayer, paint, paint sprayer budget range, but wants to try and do things right, you know, but only has, you know, a couple hundred bucks to spend. Well, if you're buying a paint sprayer, it's generally more than. Uh, <laughs> okay. Bad example. Yeah. But if <laughs> you, know, you, buy, you know what I mean? Don't buy a paint sprayer. That's those things yeah. aren't made for agricultural use. That's one of the biggest challenges. The seals don't last stuff like that. Um, but the backpack sprayer, yeah, you're, you're in the, the you know, $500 range for our back. Like, like for example, I want to set up some growth chambers to do some trials here, yep. you know, in, at my house, you know, maybe just 10 to 10, 15 plants. Um, how could I apply Sufoil X or some Bavaria product, you know, and realizing that I may not be getting quite the efficacy that I may want, you know, I might get from something like a BP4. What would you recommend though, for someone like that? that so know, there, there are some good pump ups that can get, like 60 PSI, that's generally about the max you're going to see those things work, but better than like the 30, 40. Some of the, some of the cheap stuff that's meant for herbicides and stuff like that, you yeah. don't want high pressure for herbicides. So that's fine. But if you want to do, you know, Birchmeyer makes some really good, like little pump up jobs, whether it's a backpack or even like a, you know, a little two gallon job 